Zip Tie Domes presents The Hidden History of the Geodesic Dome A Study of How New Ideas Are Formed Part 4 The Dreams of Buck Minister Fuller Bucky Fuller was an educator, an inventor, a salesman, and above all, a dreamer. But what made Fuller great was that he never recognized the failure of his dreams, but saw each setback as a learning experience. And so each failure he encountered became another step forward on the road to success. Richard Buckminster Fuller was born in 1895 and briefly attended Harvard University before being expelled for lack of effort. Fuller then worked as a mechanic in a textile mill and then as a laborer in the meatpacking industry. In 1922, Bucky Fuller and his father-in-law developed the stockade building system, which made bricks made out of compressed wood chips that were covered in plaster so as to be weatherproof and fireproof. Concrete columns were poured through the holes in the bricks, providing support for load-bearing walls. Even though the company was liquidated in 1927, the ability to sell wood chips to be used as fireproof bricks proved Fuller's salesmanship and that Fuller was able to demonstrate radically new ideas to the public. But if Fuller had only hired a construction expert to analyze his idea, he would have known very early whether or not a brick made from wood chips would be accepted by the construction industry, which was crucial for the stockade building system to be a commercial success. By 1928, Fuller was displaying a prototype of the Dymaxion House at the Marshall Fields store in Chicago. The word Dymaxion was invented by Waldo Warren, the advertising manager of the Marshall Fields store, to describe Fuller's small-scale model of a futuristic house that he displayed inside the store. Waldo Warren coined the word Dymaxion as Fuller constantly used the words dynamic, maximum, and tension to describe his design. Fuller later built two full-size models of his Dymaxion house, such as this one in Wichita, Kansas. The Dymaxion house was designed like an umbrella with the entire house supported by a single upright post, which also carried the utilities and plumbing. The Dymaxion house, held up by only this single support post in the center of the house, was a radical departure from any other construction design. It was not based on linear thinking that started with a working design that was already in production and then improved to suit a better purpose. After implementation of the Dymaxion house, it was found that the aluminum covering used for the roof was expensive and that Fuller's design was hard to modify and would not fit in with local architecture. Of the two full-size examples of the Dymaxion houses that were built, only one exists today in the Henry Ford Museum. But the word Dymaxion became associated with Bucky Fuller and established his fame as an innovator. Just in time for the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago, Fuller produced the Dymaxion car. This car was modern and stylish on the inside with an aerodynamic shape on the outside. The wheels of the Dymaxion car were placed inside the body frame and so it was very different from the cars with exterior wheels of that period as shown in this comparison to this 1933 Ford. Fuller's aerodynamic design wasn't new as it was similar to the aerodynamic car design that Ariel Persu of Romania had developed 11 years earlier. For in 1922, Ariel Persu was the first car engineer to place the wheels of the car inside the body and to design the car in an aerodynamic shape of a water drop, thus reducing the drag coefficient to one-fourth of the cars of that era. Our rail pursuit diminished the distance between the rear wheels, which meant a differential was not needed to eliminate tire wear, so that both wheels could supply power when going around a curve. This patented design meant that the 
pursue car could safely negotiate curves at up to 60 kilometers per hour. Fuller's Dymaxion car design was similar on the outside to the Pursue design, as were other aerodynamic car designs of this period. But Fuller's car had the innovation of being supported by only three wheels instead of four. This three-wheel arrangement consisted of a single rear wheel, which was used to steer the vehicle, with the two front wheels providing power. All of the other cars of this period, and all the cars of today, are steered by the front wheels and not by the rear wheels for a very good reason. This is so that when the driver stops quickly, which puts the weight of the vehicle on their front wheels, the steerable front wheels will have all the traction needed so that the vehicle can slow down and turn at the same time to avoid an obstacle. If the wheel that provides the car steering is placed in the rear of the vehicle, as in the Dymaxion car, when a sudden stop is needed, the rear of the vehicle can lift slightly, giving no traction at all to the rear wheels for steering the vehicle, especially a single rear wheel. With Fuller's Dymaxion car, you could either brake hard or swerve, but not both. This made the car very dangerous to drive or to ride in. And while Fuller's Dymaxion car with a single rear wheel for steering allowed the car to turn on a dime and look great to Fuller's audiences, it also meant that as the car picked up speed, the slight slant in the underbody of the car between the front and back wheels would aerodynamically lift the rear of the car off the ground, causing the rear steering wheel to lose all traction and the driver to lose control. Fuller promoted this unusual feature as a positive innovation and put a fin or air rudder on the back of the car so that it would extend once the car reached speeds above 50 miles an hour. This allowed the driver to steer the Dymaxion car down the road with this fin or air rudder once the back tire that was used for steering no longer touched the ground. But when the Dymaxion car reached a high speed that lifted the back wheel off the ground, any type of crosswind that came across the road would push against the metal tail fin on the back of the car and cause the front of the car to turn into the wind, which would make the car swerve uncontrollably and run off the road. It was Fuller's innovative design of a single rear wheel for steering and the air fin rudder for use at high speeds that made the Dymaxion car impractical and unsafe. These innovations, along with the very long body of the Dymaxion car supported only by three wheels, made the Dymaxion car prone to roll over, which it did with disastrous results. For at the 1933 World's Fair, this Dymaxion car with a canvas top was driven by Francis Turner, the famous race car driver, from the World's Fair to the Chicago airport. His two passengers were Colonel William Francis Forbes Simphill, the greatest aviator in England in those days, and Charles Dolphus of Paris, who was the air minister of France. According to the newspapers, this Dymaxion car hit a wave in the road, lost control, and flipped over with another car nearby. The canvas top of the Dymaxion car caved in during the rollover, killing the race driver, Francis T. Turner, with the other two passengers severely injured. Fuller gave a completely different story about this accident. Fuller said that the car of the South Park Commissioner was rubbernecking and following too close and had hit the tail of the Dymaxion car, which threw out the single rear wheel steering in the rear. Then the South Park Commissioner's car was moved immediately from the scene of the accident, which proved it was a collision and not a freak rollover. Fuller said the coroner stated that the wreck was a mutual responsibility caused by some kind of carelessness, but not the real fault of anybody, so there were no charges filed. From this, Bucky Fuller stated that the Dymaxion car was in no way responsible for the wreck. But what doesn't add up is why the South Park Commissioner was never charged with involuntary manslaughter or for leaving the scene of an accident after colliding with another vehicle and causing a wreck which killed one person and injured two others. Or how the coroner's statement that there was some kind of carelessness 
but not the real fault of anybody, if a collision had been caused by the South Park Commissioner that killed the Dymaxion driver. Rather, the coroner's statement correctly implies that there is carelessness and a mutual responsibility between the driver and the passengers when they agree to ride in an unsafe three-wheel vehicle where the rear steering wheel comes off the ground from hitting a bump in the road, which makes the vehicle lose control, swerve, and roll over. And this is exactly what the newspaper said had happened based on eyewitness accounts. Due to this wreck, all investment in the Dymaxion car was canceled and the production line was halted. Only three Dymaxion cars were ever built. But if Bucky Fuller had only used linear thinking and improved on the existing design or worked with a seasoned car designer like Ariel Pursue to help him with his radical new car design, he would have known a three-wheeled car steered by a single back wheel was unsafe before he ever went into production. Fuller's car design was a dangerous failure, but due to Fuller's incredible self-promotion, the Dymaxion car became well known not as a failure, but as a successful prototype for the car of the future. The next idea Fuller had was the Dymaxion bathroom, made in 1936. This was made from four stamps, sheet metal, or molded plastic sections, with each section light enough to be carried by two workers. All of the appliances, pipes, and wires were built in, limiting on-site construction to mere hookup. This was another brilliant idea made by a very independent inventor without any help from the construction industry. The Dymaxion bathroom was not a linear improvement to any known existing design. It was such a jump to an entirely new design that it was not accepted by the public and so was not practical enough to compete in the marketplace. Only 13 Dymaxion bathrooms were ever built. With World War II on the horizon, Fuller's next project in 1940 was called the Dymaxion Deployment Unit, a metal building intended to house Army officers. The Dymaxion Deployment Unit consisted of a 20-foot circular hut constructed out of corrugated steel that looked like a grain bin with portholes for windows. The interior was somewhat insulated and it had a hole in the top of the dome ceiling with a cap for ventilation. The Army Signal Corps bought only 200 of these units before they were canceled. According to Fuller, it was canceled because of lack of steel. But the real reason it was canceled by the Army is that Fuller's Dymaxium deployment units used a round or circular design that could not be expanded to any larger size than just 20 feet wide. The Army had other designs, such as the steel Quonset huts, that were based on a half cylinder that were designed so they could be connected and extended as long as necessary. These Quonset huts did not leak and were strong enough to be buried underground for munition storage. In comparison to Fuller's 200 units, the Army bought literally hundreds of thousands of these Quonset huts during World War II because they could be built to any size and did not leak. Fuller's 20-foot wide Dymaxium deployment units not only leaked, they were found to be unlivable. Bennington College in Vermont had been an early supporter of Fuller and had one of his Dymaxium deployment units installed by Fuller on their campus in 1942. But according to a memo dated April 6, 1945, when the choreographer Lewis Horst was scheduled to visit Bennington College that summer, he had already suffered during his last visit a traumatic experience with the all-metal Dymaxion house during an electrical storm and so could not be housed there. Another Bennington College memo dated March 23, 1948, states that the college was trying to return the Dymaxium deployment unit to Fuller as it could no longer be used as living quarters. A final inter-office memo from Murray McGuire, who was the superintendent of buildings and grounds at Bennington College, dated July 15, 1949, gives us the gory details on why the Dymaxium deployment unit was not successful. It reads as follows. The Dymaxium house has proved very unsatisfactory as living quarters. During the summer, it is so warm, 
it is impossible to stay there, especially in the daytime. And during the winter, it is the other extreme, very cold. This house, which was constructed under Mr. Fuller's supervision, has leaked ever since it was first built. The floors are so wet at the present time that water will come up through the cracks in the floors. Considering this condition, no doubt, the entire foundation has deteriorated and would have to be replaced. For health conditions, no person should be asked to live in this house under the existing conditions. I do not believe it would be practical to spend any money on this building, as I am certain from speaking to the people who have tried to live there that it will never prove satisfactory. This memo has to be an unbiased appraisal of the Dibaxium Deployment Unit, since Bennington College had a very positive relationship with Bucky Fuller, as Bennington College was the college selected to educate Fuller's daughter, Allegra Fuller. This memo also sheds light on why only 200 Dimaxim deployment units were sold to the Army Signal Corps before being canceled, as these chronic problems with water leakage and other issues made them suitable at best for storage and not for officers' quarters. Had Fuller not worked so independently on his own designs, but if he had worked alongside a construction expert to help him develop the Dimaxim deployment unit, these problems with insulation and leakage could have been solved. So, by 1948, Fuller now had created five independently developed ideas, and none of them were a commercial success. These ideas were the Stock A building system, the Dimaxian house, the Dimaxian car, the Dimaxian bathroom, and the Dimaxian deployment unit. But Fuller only saw success in everything he did and never gave up, which is a good lesson for all of us. And we have to admire his salesmanship, for Bucky Fuller was unstoppable before an audience. As a lecturer, Bucky Fuller could speak for eight hours straight. He had an entire cult of young people who followed his every word. Fuller coined the word livingry as the opposite of weaponry, which he called Killingry. Fuller popularized the term Spaceship Earth and other terms and even gave the name geodesic to the geodesic dome. So by 1948, Bucky Fuller was somewhat in demand as a lecturer and so was perfect for teaching at Black Mountain College, which is where he may have been influenced by Walter Gropius. Black Mountain College hosted a summer session in North Carolina where young artists could learn from prominent intellectuals. And in 1948, at 53 years old, Fuller was still seeking lasting recognition, which he found with the geodesic dome. And the question remains, if Walter Gropius had provided any information about Walter Bearsfield's 1924 geodesic dome to Bucky Fuller, would Fuller have acknowledged where this idea came from? I think the answer is no because if Fuller had said that he was using Bayersfield's original design from 1924, it would not give Fuller the attention and fame that he needed on the lecture circuit as a modern inventor of 1948. Fuller appeared to be the sole inventor of the geodesic dome and that he had come up with this idea completely on his own. Fuller never even mentioned the work of Walter Bayersfield or acted like he knew about Bayersfield. And perhaps he did not know. This is a reasonable possibility. But if he did know about Bearsfield Dome with help from Walter Gropius and gave credit to the Bearsfield Dome design as being the source of where he got his original idea, Bucky Fuller may not have been able to receive a patent on the geodesic dome in 1954 as Bearsfield had already patented his original geodesic dome in Germany in 1924. Fuller never mentioned Bayersfield's 1924 patent in his geodesic dome patent application, and for good reason. For if Bayersfield's 1924 patent, written in German, had been studied by the United States Patent Examiner, Fuller may not have been granted a patent due to prior art, that is, someone else had already patented the geodesic dome, and so it could not be patented a second time. But there is another reason that Fuller would not advertise where the geodesic dome idea originated. And I will try and say this with all due respect to his reputation, for I do admire his abilities, and so this will be one of the few negative traits that I have to say about Bucky Fuller. 
And the only reason I'm discussing this trait is that I'm trying to show that Walter Gropius could have been the hidden connection between the Bearsville Dome and the Fuller Dome designs. So here it is. On at least one occasion, Bucky Fuller had absolutely no problem with taking someone else's idea, changing it slightly, and then calling it his own, and obscuring the original inventor as being the true source of the idea. This trait is painfully evident in the case of Kenneth Snelson. Kenneth Snelson was an impressionable 20-year-old college student when he met Bucky Fuller at Black Mountain College in 1948. Snelson was a sculptor and had been working with artistic mobiles using struts and wires, much like the artist Alexander Calder. Snelson had invented what he called floating compression, which was a series of struts that did not touch each other, but were held in place by cables under tension. According to a letter that Kenneth Snelson wrote to R. Motro for the International Journal of Space Structures in November of 1990, Snelson first showed Fuller his model of floating compression, a floating X piece, at Black Mountain College in June 1949. Fuller took the X piece model from Snelson for study and never returned it, and then told Snelson that his X piece configuration was wrong. Then, six months later, in December 1949, Fuller sent a very positive letter to Snelson, where he described Snelson's models as energetic geometry, and that Kenneth Snelson's name would be known as the true pioneer of this idea. But a little over a year later, in January 1951, Fuller was publishing pictures of Snelson's floating compression model in an architectural forum magazine without mentioning Snelson's name at all. When Snelson asked why he was left out, Fuller said that Snelson could afford to remain anonymous for a while. Fuller coined a new name for Snelson's idea and called it Tensegrity, which Fuller derived from tensional integrity. So then, eight years later, in 1959, the now 31-year-old Kenneth Snelson, who was no longer the naive college student at Black Mountain College, learned that Bucky Fuller was to have a show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that included a 30-foot Tenzingretti mast. Kenneth Snelson spoke directly to Arthur Drexler, the curator at the museum, about Snelson's invention and his part in developing Fuller's Tenzingretti mast. This forced Fuller's hand. At last, Kenneth Snelson's name was added to the public record for authoring his own idea. But Fuller had also made some changes to Snelson's original floating X piece and transposed it into a tetrahedron shape. This was a much more complicated design than Snelson's and added more complexity than needed. But it made it different, and so Fuller was able to patent his own version of Snelson's idea. As we will see in a later video, Fuller may have used the same technique with the Bearsfield geodesic dome design by dividing the dome triangles in a different manner than Bearsfield, which made certain that he could get past Bearsfield's 1924 patent as being prior art. But these changes also made Fuller's dome designs much more complicated. And these two very similar activities by Fuller, namely the variation of Snelson's floating compression idea that could be patented as Fuller's own idea of Tenzingretti, and the variation of the Bearsfield geodesic dome design that could be patented as his own version of the geodesic dome, these two activities both occurred in the same year of 1949, which helps us to see a pattern. Yes, I believe that Fuller learned about Bearsfield's dome from Walter Gropius, just as he learned about Snelson's floating compression from Kenneth Snelson. But he changed both ideas slightly, gave each idea a new catchy name, and by this means was able to make both ideas entirely his own, protected by a United States patent. And while there may be something unethical about how Bucky Fuller dealt with Kenneth Snelson, there is absolutely nothing unethical or wrong with how Bucky Fuller reinvented the geodesic dome from the work of Walter Bearsfield. Bucky Fuller took the forgotten geodesic dome of Walter Bearsfield and made it new again. We should be thankful that he did that. Bucky Fuller was now using the same technique that every other great inventor uses, which is linear thinking, to improve an earlier idea to solve a modern problem. 
just as the design of the Deutsch Museum Mechanical Planetarium led to the Zeiss Optical Projector Planetarium, which created a need for an icosahedron soccer ball pattern for Bearsfield Starfield Projector, which then led Walter Bearsfield to use the same icosahedron pattern to build the first geodesic dome. So did Bucky Fuller redevelop the original Bearsfield dome design so it could be used for radar reflectors, houses, living spaces for humans on Mars, greenhouses, and even geodesic duck coops. An inventor is someone that takes an earlier idea and uses it to solve a new problem, such as using a movable geodesic dome to provide fresh grass for raising organic ducks and chickens, or for shelters for sheep, or even for raising puppies. As Sir Isaac Newton said, we each stand on the shoulders of giants. But to believe that Bucky Fuller dreamed up the geodesic dome of Walter Bearsfield a second time entirely on his own initiative with no engineering degrees of his own, but that Fuller just reimagined a nearly identical design of Bearsfield geodesic dome entirely on his own during exactly the same time Fuller was spending the summer with Walter Gropius, the only architect in America who had actually worked with Walter Bearsfield and seen Bearsfield's original dome, I would say you would have to be somewhat naive to believe this theory. Great ideas are built upon other great ideas, and it is likely that Bucky Fuller's first real commercial success through the development of the geodesic dome was built upon the successful idea of Walter Bearsfield. Bucky Fuller patented almost every idea he had to protect his ideas, but also to show the world his ideas were valuable and recognized by the United States Patent Office. Bucky Fuller received United States Patent 268235 in 1954 for his version of Bearsfield's geodesic dome design, and then he received United States Patent 306-3521 in 1962 for his version of Snelson's floating compression idea, which he called Tensegretti. Fuller also received patent 2986241 in 1961 on what he called the octet truss. This was a space frame and nearly identical to the tetrahedral truss invented by Alexander Graham Bell for his study of man-carrying kites in 1903. Fuller was asked about the similarity between what he called his octet truss and Bell's tetrahedral truss for kites in an interview as follows. Question. It seems to me that Bell's tetrahedron, which he developed while working on kites, is very much like your geodesic structure. Fuller. Exactly the same. Question. When you developed your structures, did you know about the work of Alexander Graham Bell? Fuller. I did not. I was astonished to learn about it later. It is the way nature behaves, so we both discovered nature. It isn't something you invent, you discover. I had the great advantage of being allowed to look through all of Bell's notes in Washington at the National Geographic Society. His grandson had me admitted to his beautiful notebooks, and I found where he comes to the actual discovering of it. The thing he was interested in was how to make a stronger airplane wing. He was probably taken with aviation pioneer Samuel Pierpart Langley and all the others he was trying to understand how he was, might do something better. And he comes to discovering omni-triangulation. I call it the octahedron-tetrahedron truss. Then of course he went right on with his kites, but I knew absolutely nothing about it until I had discovered the same thing myself. So, perhaps Bucky Fuller had a unique mental power for cyclically rediscovering exactly the same inventions someone else had already invented a long time ago through a type of spiritual osmosis. Or perhaps nature really does replant the seed of the same idea more than once. You will have to decide that for yourself. But what we learn is that it was the ideas that Fuller somehow rediscovered from other examples and improved with his own linear thinking such as the octet truss, tensegretti, and the geodesic dome, these ideas had a much greater commercial success than his own independently derived ideas 
of the stockade building system, the Dymaxion house, the Dymaxion bathroom, the Dymaxion car, and the Dymaxion deployment unit. This shows that when an inventor who uses linear thinking to build upon an existing idea will have a greater chance for commercial success than, than an inventor trying to introduce an entirely new idea that is unproven in the marketplace. This should encourage every inventor to look at expired patents and older designs and see if they can make an improvement that would create an entirely new application to solve a modern problem. And regardless of how Fuller got his ideas, if Fuller had not accidentally or otherwise rediscovered the design of Bearsfield's geodesic dome and promoted it, it would likely have been forgotten for some time. And we have a good pictorial history of Fuller's efforts to rediscover the Bearsfield geodesic dome at Black Mountain College, whether he received any help from Walter Gropius or not. From the pictures of Fuller's various dome prototypes, he is obviously struggling with perfecting the, the design. And Fuller's efforts of prototyping the design is the hallmark of a true inventor. So regardless of what has been said so far, I believe that Bucky Fuller should get full credit for giving us the modern geodesic dome. He was a great inventor. So in the next video, let's look at Fuller's rediscovery of the geodesic dome at Black Mountain College in 1948 and 1949. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks.